In this video, I'm going to tell you about the top secret and perfected version of the incredible Boeing B-29 Superfortress. I'll explain what was different, what on earth these devices were, and why it was eventually scrapped. I'm Paul Stewart, and I make videos about planes and a few rockets. This includes guided tours around interesting aircraft in museums and reviews on board flights from around the world. If you're into these types of videos, then please check out my channel and subscribe. Let's begin with some history. The B-29 program was the single most expensive project of World War II, and the resultant aircraft was an incredible piece of engineering with a pressurized cabin and an advanced remote firing turret system. Over 3,900 were built, including bomber, weather, reconnaissance, and in-air refueling versions. They were also used during the development of many other systems, including this XB-29G, which carried jet engines in the Bombay, allowing testing at high altitudes. But the biggest problem was the engines, and this was addressed with the B-50 upgrade, which I've shown you around in a separate video, and that included the upgraded engines, a larger tail, reinforced wings and landing gear. The very last B-50A from the Air Force's initial order was kept by Boeing and turned into the YB-50C, which was to become the prototype for the new and larger B-54, as Boeing thought that the sturdy design still had more potential. As you may recall in my B-50 video, that the Air Force didn't show much interest with the upgraded B-29 when it was still called the B-29D. But when renamed the B-50, it sounded much newer and it was more exciting. This aircraft started out as the B-50C, but in recognition of the many changes, it was later redesignated the B-54. Now this is different to my usual tour video as this no longer exists, so it will be a tour around some previously classified photos from Boeing's top secret design studio. The no section remained circular, which was ideal for distributing the forces from the pressurized interior. This section of the flat glass here was to avoid interfering with the bomb site just inside. In fact, you'll see other aircraft such as the B-36 also had a flat piece of glass, although it was later replaced with a plug as they moved to a periscopic bomb site down through the floor. This also used the B-50D's less complex glass house in contrast with the seven-piece setup from earlier superfortresses. And this also helped visibility as the crew wouldn't be looking through so many frames. And speaking about vision, this up here is the hemispheric gun sight. The gunner could sit comfortably still and look into this eyepiece and get an unimpeded view of the outside. These were positioned in multiple locations throughout the aircraft. The gunner's hand grips would move both the gun and the scanning prisms inside the sight's head so that the bullets would fire towards wherever the gunner was looking. These would work in conjunction with the radar system in the dome below. Here's a B-52D's tail, and you can see a similar periscopic sight, although it's less obvious. And this big dome down here was the targeting radar. This was especially helpful in the dark, when the visual sight would have been a lot less helpful, other than looking for the explosions from the incoming fighters' cannons, and in clouds. Looking inside, and you can make out the co-pilot seat, and behind them was the flight engineer's position, which would have been sitting facing aft, and looking at this panel of dials and controls. Now there are photos online of this B-29, which has been associated with the B-54, but that's not the case. This was actually Project S-68, which was an evaluation of manned turrets on the B-29 in case the advanced new General Electric turret system wasn't going to work. This had two single 50 cal guns at the front and manned upper and lower turrets too. In the end, the General Electric systems worked very well, so this system wasn't needed. There was a reconnaissance RB-54 planned, and here's a mock-up of that, and the biggest change is the lack of a targeting radar dome. Moving a little further back, and we have one of the 14 50 cal machine gun turrets. These would be controlled through the hemispheric sights located throughout the aircraft. Here's what they would look like from inside the fuselage. Back underneath and behind the gun is the navigation radar. The B-29 had a radar system further aft sitting between the two bomb bays, but this was moved forward because, and this brings me to the next change, this had a single and much larger bomb bay that could carry nuclear bombs. 
Now, while the B-29 did carry the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs, they required considerable modifications. The K-1 was an advanced new system that would automatically measure distance and time to the target, calculate the bomb trajectory based upon the altitude, temperature and crosswinds, and then automatically drop the bomb at the correct time, and help direct the navigator back home. It was designed by Sperry Gyroscope, and while it was installed in a mock-up, as you can see here, it was so large that it required the sacrifice of the belly turret, so they would have had to make do with the old-fashioned bombing system as you can see here. This system fitted much easier into the massive B-36, and I'll point that out in my guided tour video around that aircraft on my channel. The B-50s Pratt & Whitney R-4360s were replaced with R-4360-51s, featuring variable discharge turbine engines, producing 4,500 horsepower or 340 kilowatts each. Here's a diagram to explain the new technology, with the 28 cylinders in four rows in a radial layout, the exhaust gas exits via this pipe, and spins the turbine which increases the pressure of incoming air. That pressurised air then goes into the cylinders at a high pressure, hence the turbo supercharging. Exhaust gases were also expelled through a variable area nozzle, and by squeezing this nozzle, jet thrust would be generated, adding another 1,000 horsepower over the standard engine in the B-50. It really was a clever design. On the topic of jet engines, unfortunately they couldn't be added to this, as we saw with the KB-50 in air refueler without again another wing redesign, so this was considered a mark against this aircraft versus the B-36, which had jets added. Due to the extra power, the wings had to be modified with a 20 foot or 6 meter increase in wingspan, and the cord was also increased by 6 feet at the wing root and 4 feet at the wingtip. These were now so large that outrigger wheels had to be installed in engine number 1 and 4's nacelles. Apparently this was an unpopular decision, as they would have had to widen taxiways at operating bases. The larger wings necessitated a longer fuselage as well, which was stretched 10 feet or 3 meters, which helped with the increased bomb load as well. In addition to the fuel tanks within the wings, wing-mounted auxiliary fuel tanks carried an additional 3,000 gallons or 11,000 liters, and this helped with the intended range of 9,300 miles or 15,000 kilometers. Looking at the tail end again, and we have the gun turret. This photo really highlights how much better the gunner's view would have been from the periscopic bombsight head, which clears the many panels and other bits and bobs that would have been obscuring their view as they would have been looking from around here. Under here is a targeting radar as well, and this would have been part of the vertical fin. Just comparing this and the B-29, from which it was based, the B-29 weighed 120,000 pounds, or 54 tonnes, while the B-54 would weigh up to 207,000 pounds, or 93 tonnes. The B-29 had a range of 3,250 miles, while the B-54 had a projected range of over 7,300 miles. On the 29th of May, 1948, the Air Force placed orders for 14 of the B-54A bombers and 29 RB-54A reconnaissance aircraft. Construction started on the B-54 prototype in Seattle, but just 11 months later, in April 1949, the project was cancelled. While the USAF Chief of Staff General Hoyt Vandenberg and Secretary of the Air Force Stuart Symington were apparently supportive of the B and RB-54, the Strategic Air Command Head General Curtis LeMay preferred the Convert B-36 with a much longer range and bigger bomb load. Just for comparison's sake, here's a photo of the B-36 next to the much smaller B-29, just highlighting how massive that new aircraft was. LeMay suggested that the B-54 should be canned, which obviously upset Boeing and the city and journalist of Seattle. The Joint Chiefs of Staff had approved a combination of medium and heavy bombers, and while the B-36 carried out the heavy bomber role, there was still debate about the medium bomber. The cost was increasing, and some even suggested building more B-50s, but eventually LeMay suggested that the funding should be directed into accelerating Boeing's own B-47 stratagem project. 
That idea was agreeable by all involved and Boeing stopped work on what was apparently a 75% completed B-54 prototype that was scrapped. If you enjoyed the video then please give it a thumbs up and check out my tours around the aircraft I've mentioned in this video including the B-29, B-50, B-47 and the massive B-36. Thanks for watching.